You don't touch anything else. Does it say standard? Uh, I don't see standard. Do you see Actually, any words at all? I see a blinking red light and the, the image. Okay, we're probably good. Either that or it's on time lapse. Uh, okay. Either way, we're good. How do you check that? Like, you just press yeah, a button? Please. This one? The red one? No. How did you do that? Yeah, well, you're the CEO. Yeah, you know how to do these things. It's fine. We should, unless you touch something, we're on standard. It shouldn't change. Okay, okay we're going to do the spring problem. It's, it is not the single most important problem, like a lot of people will say, but it is a very interesting problem because it, it brings in all of the tools that we have so far to solve problems. And it gives us a nice little simple thing. Now, go back to Calc 2 for a moment. Okay, here's the spring problem in Calc 2. Okay, there was a couple of assumptions that we made, and it's really important that we understand these assumptions. Two assumptions. First of all, the spring is uniform. It is exactly the same throughout, okay? It doesn't have spots where it's thicker and thinner, because non-uniform would mean that you can't do any calculations. How many have ever played with a slinky? Okay, did you have any older siblings? Yeah. Okay, so they stretched it beyond repair? Yes. You may, yeah, you remember that. Yeah, that's what older siblings do. They stretch the slinky, so now it's no longer uniform. It's, it doesn't work for the spring problem. The second assumption we make is that it is long enough that no matter how much I stretch it or compress it, I'm not going to run out of room. Okay? I mean, for all practical purposes, it could be infinitely long and it wouldn't change any of the math. But if this spring you know, were only a few inches long and I said, no, we just stretch it 12 feet, well, you can't. You know? So it's got to be long enough that no matter how much you stretch it or compress it, you weren't going to run out. With that said, then, all springs that are uniform in nature, not thicker or thinner, have a spring constant. They have a constant that describes the spring itself. And all you have to do is either compress it or stretch it, and the idea being you're gonna get the same number. So the amount of force required to stretch it a certain distance is exactly the same amount of force as that's required to compress it, as long as I don't run out of room. And then from there we can figure out the spring constant. So if this is calc 2, we'd say something like, 100 newtons required, let's say, to stretch the spring, I don't know, let's say 50 centimeters. So the spring constant, okay, would be, I figure it out backwards. Remember, the, basically this is Hooke's law, says that the force is equal to a constant times the displacement if it's uniform. If it's not, then this is too complicated and too much information. Now, that means the constant is force over displacement. So in this case, that would be 100 newtons over 50 centimeters. Right? No. no. Why not? It's not standard. Newton, yes. Newtons has meters inside. Yeah. yeah. I, I, this one, if you've had physics, it makes my life so much easier. Mm -hmm. um, you, if I said I want you to measure the area of the floor and I'm going to give you a yardstick or a meter stick and you're going to go this way, you, go, you can't have two different units of measure in the same, measuring the same thing. No, a newton <coughs> is in meters, so I can't have both. So I can change this to something involving centimeters, or I can change the bottom into meters, which is easier. The bottom into meters. Okay. What is a newton, by the way? Kilogram meter per second. Square. One kilogram. So at one meter per second squared. What if I took one centimeter, right, at, you know, or excuse me, I took one gram at, you know, one centimeter per second. Oh, it's a dyne. It's a dyne, good. You actually remember. That's one of the few things I remember from physics, which is 10 to the negative fifth times as many. Yeah, it does matter. So instead of that, we put 0.5 meters. And this gives us 200 newtons per meter. So now when I want to do this, now here's the thing. That's my spring constant, right? But as I'm moving, it's going to require more and more force to move it further and further and further. I, and so, because force is not going to be constant. Why isn't force constant? It's a constant multiple of s. Now, a lot of times we use an x here, because then when we integrate, it's easier to remember. So the work technically is from a to b of ks ds. And in calc 2, you probably use an x, and that's just fine. It does, that's not a problem. But that's not variable, so that it required, excuse me, it's not constant, so it required integration. And then it was really easy. And what units were you probably using here if we're using newtons here? Meters. Work. Oh, joules. Joules. 
Joules. Joules would be what? A newton meter. Yeah. But you don't say newton meters. That'd be like saying, you know, the volume of my refrigerator, it's, I've got, you know, 80 feet, 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 you know. <laughs> I know I've had people actually answer, what's the area of the floor? It's like 3,000 feet, feet. Yeah, it might be correct, but it's, it just sounds really silly. So that was Calc 2. Life was good. Because what didn't we have to worry about? Since we're going sideways. Gravity. That's Calc 2. We're not in Calc 2 anymore. So our spring problem is going to be a little different. Our spring problem is going to be, and now we're going to hang something from here. We'll call it a mass that we're going to hang, but obviously it's the weight of the mass that's going to be important. Okay? Everything's different because now gravity does come into play. How does gravity come into play here on my mass? As a force that goes there. It's well, the opposite direction. Well, no, no, you guys are getting too technical. I have a mass. How does gravity affect the situation? I mean, it's the acceleration. How much do you weigh? Mass of a certain amount of Newtons. <laughs> I always laugh when people tell me, ah, I weigh, uh, you know, 75 kilograms. That'd be like saying, how old are you? 75 kilograms. How tall are you? 75 kilograms <laughs> isn't even like weight. And, and I always... I'm always amazed that even people with that physics don't understand. No, mass is not weight. Mass is mass. Length is length. Age is age. These are not things that cross over. Mass becomes weight only when multiplied by gravity. gravity. And is that uniform throughout the solar system, throughout the galaxy, throughout the universe? No. Is it even uniform throughout planet Earth? No. No. Oh, yeah. So when you say weight, that's mass with gravity applied to it. Now the mass is the mass regardless of the environment, right? The mass is the same on the moon or on Jupiter or on Earth, but they weigh different amounts because the gravity is different. So assuming gravity here, we'll, we'll keep it simple. I have a mass hanging from here because the idea is that it shouldn't matter my environment. Well, but I need the weight, okay? It's just resting. We call that equilibrium. That makes it easy. So here's what I want to do. Mg. I want to pull it up and see what happens. So when I pull it down, I can push up, but it's easier to just pull it down. It's going to go back up, isn't it? It's going to start oscillating. Will it oscillate forever? No. no. That's a tricky system, one. Though. It looks like a downturning stock that starts like this. <laughs> <laughs> why, why won't it oscillate forever? Aircraft and not conservative. Can it? If there's a certain situation where I can technically make it a perpetual motion machine? Yeah, and the physics yeah. would work. <laughs> if it's in a perfect world. In the vacuum. In the vacuum. Ooh. So we're not going to do it in the vacuum. So we will definitely have the diminishing returns there. Okay. Now, there's two different situations that are going to happen. We're going to just pull this and let it go on its own, or we're going to apply a motor to it at some point. So it allows it, right? basically to continue moving on it. So we're going to do each version of this. None of them are complicated, but we have to figure out what is the differential equation that will be solved. And it is a differential equation because there's a couple of different things going on here. One is the fact that I have gravity, which is a form of acceleration, but acceleration is a second derivative of something. I also have the fact that I have some initial speed and we're also going to do this through different environments. For example, I might do this underwater. I might do this in motor oil, right? Different environments that will affect the initial speed, and the speed we know would be a first derivative. So we're going to end up solving a second order differential equation at some point. And what we use to solve it will be exactly what we've been using. There will not be any new technique whatsoever, okay? So let me walk you through a couple of things. Because when I teach Calc 2, and I say, you applied this much force to get it to move. So we found our spring constant. How much work are you going to do to move it this far? You get a positive number. And force equals a constant times displacement. That's all positive. You're pulling on this thing, and it's moving. You're not doing the work now. You're not doing the spring is, which now changes things. So when I say, you you are pushing this much on the spring. What's the spring doing? It's, it's pushing that much on you. 
So the force that the spring is using is what compared to you? Opposite to you. Yeah, it's the negative. That's why so sometimes you'll see the equation force equals negative Ks. That's not the force you're applying, that's the reaction of the spring on you. So I always have fun with this, because in Calc 2 we do a lot of this at the beginning. Was anybody here in my Calc 2? No, I think a couple of you may have been used to one admit it anymore. It's been so long ago. But I'll say, you know, you're hitting the punching bag. Why is it when you're hitting the punching bag, does it feel like the punching bag's hitting back? Because it is. <laughs> right? Oh, right? For every action. Equal and opposite. Yeah, that, I don't like those words. It, there's, a, there's an action in the opposite direction. Right? Force is applied exactly in the opposite direction. And since force is directional and it's a vector, we know it's just the negative of that vector. That's really important in this, in this process. So let's start with what we know. Okay. Weight, which is going to equal mass times gravity. I'm using a little m for mass. Is also going to equal. Somewhere I have it here. It's also going to equal. Okay, yeah, remember that we talked about the spring constant? That's still the same spring constant, and it's still the same displacement. So the weight, I've got this mass, it's come to rest here. If I have a really thick spring, has anyone ever seen the coils in a car, like by your tires? I remember uh, years ago I had a friend, you know, and his dad took apart the car, and we'd stand on the coils, you know, and we couldn't move. <laughs> My body weight wasn't enough to put any movement on those coils. It needed a whole car. Yeah, those things had a ridiculously large spring, right? It required a tremendous amount of force to give it to move a small distance. So I'm at rest here. I have a spring constant. The displacement from, imagine no mass. There's no mass on here. It's up here. Agreed? I put the mass. I don't want it oscillating. I let it rest. It has stretched a certain distance from its resting point. That's what the S is, okay? So these things right here are equal right off the start, because why? Because the weight is balancing with the displacement from the spring itself, okay? So we start with that. Um, so in general, if we have, sometimes we write it in this form. It's the same thing, okay? So now here's the thing. I'm gonna make sure I got everything. We're gonna call, so X is going this way. So this line will be x equals zero. Yeah, we don't use a y. I don't know why. We just we use an x. And oh, sorry, I'll move up this way. X is a function of time ultimately because we're going to start oscillating. Okay. Now, uh, do you guys remember doing things like fluid force in Calc two? Which way do we measure distance and direction? If you're at the surface of the water, we don't say you're negative eight feet deep, do we? We say you're eight feet deep. In other words, the positive is going downwards, if you think about it, right? Depth is measured going downwards. We're going to do the same thing here. A positive x means I've stretched it past equilibrium. So a negative x would actually mean it's going this way. So we orient it backwards for the simple reason why I'm saying I want you to pull it this far. And that this far will be a positive number. So it's a little backwards, and also x is going to be the vertical. Okay, that feels a little backwards, but that's okay. So when I do this, I'm gonna have a certain acceleration. And of course, we know what weight is in general. Weight is mass time, or excuse me, force in general we know is mass times acceleration. I'm gonna go vectorless to make it simple because we're only moving on a line. So that means the magnitudes are not gonna be changed. There's no cosine of theta in here. When you first did this stuff, before Calc 3, you treated these as numbers. You didn't treat them as vectors. And, and we're kind of doing the same thing. As long as we're moving on a line, I don't have to worry about cosine of theta. So I can say the magnitude of force, we'll just call it magnitude rather than vector. Because otherwise, that's a vector, that's a scalar, that's a vector. But because they're going in the same direction, we don't have issues with magnitude. And I know some of you physics folks are going, don't we have to write vectors here? OK, well, if you want to just put little vertical bars on there, right? To make it simpler. So we've got this going on. So if this is the case, then this is also, right, movements in the x direction. So acceleration would be the second derivative. Now, what does this equal? Well, this will be exactly, remember how we said force of the spring itself is negative ks. The force you apply is positive. The force the spring is applying is obviously in the opposite direction. 
So this is going to be negative k. This was sitting up here. I put the mass on it. It stretched it to here. S, if it helps you, you know, think of that as S. S is constant. S is not a variable. S is, S is absolutely constant. But now I'm also going to move it x. Okay? So this here, and then that will be plus the weight there. All right? So the first one we generally call, let me see, let me make sure I got my. I know that I'm going to call it. That. That's the weight. Does anybody know what this guy is called? Some of you may have read this, you may have done this in your physics class. It's the thing that's going to be bringing me back to the start. It's called the restoring force. So I have the restoring force, which is in the opposite direction. Why? Because when I pull it, it wants to go in the other direction, doesn't it? So the weight, the weight is actually constant. Okay. So we've got this. So if I distribute that, it's negative ks. Uh, excuse me, negative kx, negative ks plus mg. There's something here I really like. Did I catch that? That's zero, always. So now I'm down to just this. And that's probably a really diff easy differential equation. Now this is the this is the least. Okay, this is the least going on. I basically I have a spring. I hung some mass on it, got it to here, and now I'm going to pull on it, and it's going to start oscillating. Okay, in a vacuum, because that's how all springs operate, right? Now you guys remember doing stuff, you know, in, in calculus, I want to, or in calc three, I want to throw you the ball. And what do we always ignore in Calc 3? Air resistance. Air resistance. Because, of course, we put on our, our hazmat suits and we play in a vacuum. Well, actually, if I don't throw the ball very hard, and the ball is pretty much spherical, is there going to be much of any air resistance? Not really. But what if I'm, you know, the, it's really big and I'm throwing it really fast and, it, you know, kind of like a parachute effect. Well, okay, I have to worry about air resistance. So in Calc 3, we never worry about air resistance because we, we artificially create a situation just so we can understand the mathematics involved. It gets too convoluted if we start worrying about air resistance and everything else. So for right now, we're playing in a vacuum. Great. Well, it's not going to stay that way, obviously. But that's a really easy differential equation to solve. So what we do next is if I multiply through by 1 over m, some of you may recognize the ensuing equation we're about to get. Does anybody know what we usually substitute here? Omega. Keep going. Omega squared. Oh, right. Because k has to be positive, m has to be positive. So why would I put omega squared? Because then the solution to that differential equation is really, really simple. Right? It involves sines and cosines. In fact, how simple is it? The solution to this equation. Or actually, I said what? X1 and, sorry, X1 and X2. There we go. Everybody catch that? Um, we already know that. Because my lead coefficient being a 1, I don't have to worry about it. So we, we have done this problem, haven't we? <coughs> this is the most artificial, but we have to start somewhere. Okay, so far so good? So that's, so that's pretty easy. I'm pulling it down in a vacuum. And because it's in a vacuum, it's going to continue to oscillate how long? Forever. There's nothing slowing it down. There's no air resistance. There's no drag. There's no friction. Again, a little artificial, but we have to start somewhere. So this is the easiest one. Okay. Now, what if we throw a little bit of change? For example, I have an environment. Okay. I'm not in a vacuum anymore. Maybe I'm in water. I'm in some sort of viscous fluid, motor oil. The key is, whatever it is, it has to be, again, uniform. Okay, it can't be more sludgy at the top than at the bottom or vice versa, right? It's, so if it's in water or you know, pure motor oil or something like that, that's not really an issue, is it? It's going to be pretty much the same throughout. But what that does is that changes 
things like the speed, it adds one ingredient to this that makes it now a little more realistic, I think. Um, so do I have that on here? Okay, so this right here is the simplest. It's called undamped. Okay, I think I've, I've talked about harmonic motion with you guys before and talked about damping, right? Shock absorbers and things like this. Anytime you have an oscillation, that's called harmonic motion. Okay, it doesn't have to be a sine wave or a cosine wave forever, never, never. They can be getting smaller. If it's getting smaller, it's called damped, damped harmonic motion. So undamped means it's going to stay the same amplitude forever, never, never. Okay, that's not realistic, but it's the starting point. So now I'm going to change it slightly. I'm going to give you a, a, an environment, like I said. That's called a retarding voice, <coughs> retarding force, because what does that mean to retard? Literally slow means to down, slow, down. slow it down. So if I do that, the retarding force, generally speaking, because we don't want to overcomplicate it, we always say it's a scalar multiple of the speed. It doesn't have to be, we could make it a function times the speed, but then that changes this to something we can't solve in the 255 course. So we don't do that. We say the retarding force is going to be a scalar multiple of the speed. So the retarding force, generally, we, use, we like to use beta times dx dt. Okay. Now, this is still a force. Um, my original equation, this is still a force. That's a, right? Or I should say, before I divide it through by m, that was a force. That's a force, right? Kx is a force. When I divide through by m, I'm just doing that for convenience because m is a scalar. Oh, so this is also a force. So now I've got, we've got m d squared x dt squared plus beta dx dt. And by the way, you would, you would always be told what beta is. You would not usually have to figure that out. And then again, plus kx, and that equals zero now. So once again, we multiply, we multiply through by one over. You don't have to, but it just makes it the auxiliary equation so much easier because these are all scalars right here. Now, because this is no longer in this form, I don't really need to write it as omega squared. The, the omega squared now is no longer an advantage to me. So I'm inclined to just leave it like this. Right? One scalar, scalar. And now I'm going to factor the auxiliary equation and solve that. Everybody cool with that? Mm -hmm. But don't we have a whole bunch of different scenarios here? My auxiliary equation, which is quadratic, could have two reals. It could have one repeated real or two complexes. Mm -hmm. Oh. Now, the complex one is the ugly one. That's the one where you're going to have exponential times sine and cosine. Okay? And by the way, that will still produce an oscillation, but it will be, you can see, getting damped because your exponential has got to have a negative exponent. Otherwise, it means it's going out of control. I could have two real solutions, in which case I just get two different exponentials. That one's a little bit trickier to justify. And I could have one repeated solution, then we know what to do, right? I'm going to have an exponential, and then a, in this case, it would be t times the exponential, because t is my independent variable. Right Before it was x times it. But we already know how to solve that problem. Now, this is called damped harmonic motion. This is the most common one. There is one more, though, that we want to consider. And I say, we put a motor on our spring. It's called an impressed force. Where would that show up, do you think? Oh, the coefficient at the end. Not the coefficient. Oh, okay. It would be not on the other side. side. How about? In other words, not zero. OK, so now I'm going to put a motor on it. And then I can ask you things like, after this much time, where is it? When will it be at this particular place? Everybody understands all the different ways we could ask the question. If about that point, it stops being really exciting. Because once we model this and get the differential equation, solving it is <laughs> it's just not going to be difficult because you've been doing this for about a month, literally. Okay. So let's do a couple of examples of this. The, the reason people like this problem in this class, it's a really simple application where you can apply all of the techniques you've learned quite literally in chapter four. Okay, Almost every one of them will come into play, except probably not the Cauchy-Euler one, because we're not going to have coefficients of x's to powers. But we are going to have scalars. If my impressed force is not 
exponential sine, cosine, or polynomial, then I would have to use variation parameters to solve that problem. If it's one of the big four, then I can just do undetermined coefficients. If this is just a zero, oh my gosh, that's our favorite one. That's just simply the zero equation we solve. So everything we're doing, we have done. So let me grab an example here. Hold on. Where did I write it? Let's start with this one. Okay. Um, actually, you know what? To save some time, I'm going to bring this up. So are we always finding our impression, no, imp something for us, the, the one caused by the motor? You'd have to be told that. Okay. Yeah, that, that's, uh, most of the things in here you don't have to figure out. Give me just a moment. I'm going to bring this up. I'm going to save you guys a little bit of writing because I'd rather walk you through. Because th I have these notes already posted online. So rather than have you just rewrite everything, I'd rather, I'd rather you make comments. I, I probably, whoa, didn't like my password, hold on. Try that again. There we go, I'd rather have you just follow along. Why can't all my rooms do that? I never get it on the first try. in a room that I'm not used to. I don't know what the idiosyncrasies are. Okay. So we're going to look at... So there's two ways I like to ask the question. I actually do do these in English Standard quite often for the simple reason it's easier to use 32 right, for gravity than it is 9.8 because both of those are rounded off numbers anyway. But in this case, I, I did one that's purely metric. So a weight of 39.2 newtons, okay? So how do you get, how do you get from, from there to the next thing? Well, if I'm using gravity as 3.9, again, it's rounded, but we don't want the numbers to be too early, okay? So just read, read what's going on here. Gravity of 9.8 meters per second squared, so therefore, it's four kilograms mass. That's where the 39.2 newtons is going to be. Okay. So my spring constant, quite conveniently, <laughs> right, is, a, is 100 newtons per meter. So my equation here, remember, it's mass. It's, um, mass times acceleration. Okay. Now, the hold on. Um, yeah, okay, we've got everything there. So this is the first case, right? This isn't very exciting, but when I, when I get rid of the four, can you all tell me the answer to this without doing any work for the most part? Sure. Your roots are gonna be plus or minus five i, so your solutions are gonna be sine and cosine of five t. And that's what we've got somewhere, right here. Now, if I have initial conditions, let me go back a little bit. Did I give you a No, I didn't. Okay. If we have initial conditions, then you can find the other stuff. So, question? Yeah, uh, the problem didn't tell us that it was a undamped harmonic oscillation. So do we just assume that it is and then move on from there? Yeah, yeah there's nothing. If you're not given any retarding force, then, just then you, don't, you don't assume there is one. That's what I'm saying. This, was, this is kind of the lowest level. Okay, so we've got the sine and cosine part. That's great. I want to move on to the next one though, um, which actually technically is example two. I don't know why I got them out of order here. Okay. Whoop, wait a minute. Oops. Hold on. Oh, I renumbered them. Sorry, technically it should be example four. I just can't. can't. Okay. A spring that has a four pound weight and is stretched eight feet, okay, so now we're in English standard units, and I'm giving you an impressed force. That means it's the number on the other side. 
Okay? And most of the textbooks will just call that capital F of T. Force over time. Because again, time is our independent variable. So the key is how do we set this thing up? Okay? So unlike the one where you're going sideways, I don't have to do a lot of work. So I have four pounds, I'm stretching at eight feet. So what is that? One half of a pound per foot, if you want to look at it that way, okay? The weights, and it tells me that it starts below and all that kind of stuff. Now, what's the, what's the acceleration due to gravity? I'm in English standard, so it's acceleration due to gravity, 32 feet per second squared, right? So if we're four pounds, and it's 32 feet per second squared, <laughs> mass times <Eight>. acceleration <laughs> equals, four, equals the weight. So therefore, the mass is the weight divided by the acceleration, and that's what 4 over 32 is. And everybody knows that the English standard unit for mass is slugs. That is true. Um, it, that's so important that the University of California, Santa Cruz, they named it. That is their mascot. No joke. <laughs> yep. I grew up in Santa Cruz. I always thought that was very, I don't know, weird. <laughs> Stanford is now the Stanford Cardinal, which is the color red, not the bird. They went from the Stanford Indians to the Stanford Cardinals to the Stanford Cardinal, and their mascot is a, you know? It's a tree. A tree. Which makes as much sense as the color red for the word cardinal does. I, I, yeah. In Northern California, I think, do some weird things. That's why I live down here now. Yeah. So the beta in this is going to be that damping force and then the compressed yeah. force. Yeah. You notice I said the damping force is one half times the absolute value of the speed. Now, why is it absolute value? Because it doesn't matter what direction. That, that's a directional. That's just a scalar. Okay. So that's that's the coefficient of dx dt. And here's what I'm saying. Because if I said, I'm going to give you a speed, does it matter if I'm going up or down at that point? No, I'm, I'm just giving you a, a raw number. How fast was your car moving, not, not direction? So we're going to be given, like when we have an example on like the quiz or the, or the exam, like the question is going to state all of that and it's going to- It has to state all of that. Okay. Whether it's in metric or English standard is not a big deal. You're going to use 32 in English standard, you're going to use 9.8 in metric. Okay. But you have to be given everything you need. You're not always going to be given the mass. Sometimes you're going to have to figure out the mass. Oh my gosh, right? Well, if I know the weight, then I know the mass. I'm telling you the weight. I mean, does anyone here know their, their mass? <laughs> yeah, I, I know my mass. I mean, you guys all should. I'm, I'm about 5.5 slopes. It's easy. I, I weigh about 180 pounds. Yeah, divide that by 32. You know, like, you know, you guys can figure that out. Um, no, slugs is not a company. Okay, so we've got the slugs. I'm telling you the impressed force. So now let's look at the equation that this comes up with. Mass times second derivative, just for brevity of writing, I'm using the double primes here. Impressed force, so the one half is the key number here. One half the speed. That's the dx dt, right? Speed is dx dt. And then finally, where is it? Oh, here we go. Now, where does that one half come from? weight stretches at 8 feet, 4 divided by 8 mm -hmm. equals 1 half. Remember, that's the, that's the S. Mm -hmm. That's not movement. That's just, I put the weight on there and it stretched it, and that was at equilibrium. Everybody, everybody has that? That you have to figure out, but that was certainly not hard. That's not movement. Now what am I going to do? I'm going to take this thing, okay, and I'm going to impart with an upward speed of 50 feet per second, which is kind of weird. I'm going to give it a shove. By the way, would it matter which direction I went? No, I'm moving at 50 feet per second. Okay. Now, why, where is that going to figure in, the, that, that upward speed at when I start. Your initial condition. That's going to be an initial condition. Tell me another initial condition. The weight starts, the weight starts five, five feet. feet below equilibrium. Oh, so that tells me my x of zero. What is the 50 feet per second? Your e. Well, that's my f, or excuse me, my x prime of zero. Does that make sense? That's how fast. 
you guys remember doing this again, like in, in, in calc, whether it was lower level calculus or upper level calculus, you know, I'm throwing an object. The speed with, with which it leaves my hands, right, that's the initial speed. So if, I'm, if we're in calc three and I have a horizontal and a vertical and I'm throwing this thing at a particular angle, right, x of t, if you remember, was initial speed times the cosine of theta t, and then y was, you did something similar, but now you had to use gravity, okay? If I'm throwing something vertical, it's still the same thing. The cosine of theta in that case would be slightly different, but it's the same thing. I take my initial speed, so how fast is it when it leaves my hand? That would be a constant. Is it gonna stay that speed? No, no. Okay, so now we've got this ugly looking differential equation here, and the, this is given, that's the impressed force. That's my motor, if you will. So what was the one half in front of the XD? I was trying to figure it out. Oh, let's go back up. I haven't done anything yet. I've got a spring, I'm hanging a four pound weight on that spring, and how far does it stretch it? Five. No, look at the first sentence. Oh, Your four pounds is stretching it eight feet. Okay, so what is that? That's one half of a pound per foot. That's your S. Can we talk about that? Oh, okay. The, the KS. That, so I, I've just got that. Okay, that's us, the one half. The five, oops, oh, don't do that. The weight starting five feet below. Okay, I'm just saying how far does it stretch it? Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to take the weight five feet below. Remember, it's just sitting here right now, it's not moving. I'm going to stretch it five feet below and then I'm going to give it a shove upwards. So my x of zero would be positive five because I said we're stretching five feet. And my x prime of zero would be what? Negative 50. Negative 50 because we threw it upwards. Remember, we're calling downwards positive. Everybody, everybody okay with that? If I get that backwards, it's going to change everything. Okay, so I want to make sure I get that part right. Um, by the way, the oscillation, whether I went upwards at 50 or downwards at 50, the oscillation would look the same, but where I am at any given time would be different. Because if I throw it upwards at 50, then in a short period of time, I'm high. If I go downwards 50, then in a very short period of time, I'm way down here. All right, so now that we've got that, let me go back to here. Oops, I just lost my place. Where I, oh, now this multiply through by eight. Okay, get rid of that lead coefficient. So when I multiply through by eight, my new equation is right here. That guy right there. Is that a fairly simple one to solve? Well, look at your auxiliary equation. What's it gonna be? Let's do that off to the side. Okay, here's where you've got to actually, you know, write something down like where did the numbers come from? My auxiliary equation is what? M squared plus 4m plus 4 equals 0. Is that interesting? Yeah. Hmm. I have multiplicity. So what are my two linearly independent solutions? Don't, don't look at the right. You guys, you guys tell me this. E to the negative 2t and t. T in negative 2t. Yeah, because my independent variable being t, I know it's, you're used to it being x, but we're calling x the dependent. So everybody's cool with that? That we know. That, that's, there's no question about that. So my homogeneous solution is c1 e to the negative 2t plus c2 uh, t e to the negative 2t. How do I find my particular solution? What do you think? Take uh, the t cosine of 15. And it's 50 cos. So what method do you want to use to figure out your particular problem? Undetermined. Yeah, undetermined. Probably undetermined coefficients. Could I use variation of parameters? Uh, yeah. yeah, but it probably takes longer. But the undetermined coefficients, you know that your particular is going to look like what form? A cosine plus B sine? A cosine of, sorry, what is it? A cosine of 4t. 4t. Sorry, B sine. A cos 4t plus B sine 4t. Now you're going to do the usual, take two derivatives of that, 
substitute it into this equation right here. Well, not that equation, sorry. Into this equation right here, and you're going to figure out your coefficients. Not hard, but tedious. And usually you get kind of icky numbers, don't you? Usually. You don't, you don't have to. Usually. It's a particular because it was equal to something that's other than zero, and it was like one of the exactly. Big when we solve the homogeneous, there's an infinite number of solutions. Every linear combination of these two guys here, that's why we write C1 and C2, every, including the numbers zero, every real number or complex number that I replace C1 and C2 with will solve the homogeneous. But only one thing will solve the particular. That's why we treat them completely separate from each other. Then whatever I get for the particular, I'm going to add the homogeneous to it. And then I'm going to find the initial condition. I can't find the initial conditions until I find the particular because no matter what I put in for C1 and C2, it will only solve the equals zero part. It will never solve the equals function part. So now, if we're going to do the method of undetermined coefficients, so I think I have it up here. Yeah, so I've got it up there. We did all the work, blah, 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 blah. I was very friendly, wasn't I? Turns out they're not too bad. So look, your A and B turn out to be, again, not terrible. Can we go over that again? Just yeah. Really quickly? So, let's see where can I, um, I want to leave that. Let me do this. We, we know that now. So tell me. Oh, I, I keep calling this Y. Sorry, guys. Ah, X. My bad. Even I'm a creature of habit. These are X's, not Y. They're no Y's. <laughs> so what is dx, p, dt? Well, that's easy. Oh. That's going to be negative 4 sine 4t four plus 4b four B. Four B. cos 4t four and then the second derivative is going to be negative, four, oops, negative 16 a cos minus 16b sine. Just like before, and then I take those guys, I shove them back into this equation, and then from there I solve for the coefficients, and I have to have a sine and a cosine. The most common mistake is obviously, well, I have a cosine on the right, so I only need to do cosine. The problem is when you take two derivatives and a first derivative, if I just do a cosine, I'll end up with a sine that's unaccounted for, and that won't work. So I do both, and it's, as we found, if you've done any number of problems, you usually don't get zeros for either one of these. Usually you get non-zeros for both. So this one ends up being very friendly. I got negative 3 halves and 2. So that means my particular is negative 3 halves cos plus, did I say 2 or negative 2, sorry? Plus 2 sine. OK. So now do I have the entire solution? Yeah. It's this plus this plus this plus this. Now I can solve for my initial conditions. Okay, and that usually is the easiest part, by the way. That, there's nothing about that that's difficult. So my whole solution is this plus this. So now I want to solve for my initial conditions. X of zero, which is, okay, C1, there is no C2, is there? So it'll be C1, that'll be zero. What will that be? Negative three halves. And what does that have to equal? What did we say was equal to? I think it was five? Yeah. Five. So that means C1 is 13 halves. Now, be a little bit careful on the next one. Now you're going to do x prime, dx dt. But you're going to have a product rule here, aren't you? and chain rules here. So let's do the dx dt, I'll do it over here. So x prime of t or dx dt, I don't care how you say it, same thing. So what is that going to be? Um, negative 2c1 e to the negative 2t plus c2 e to the negative plus c2 e to the negative 2t minus c2t, no. I think that's correct. All right. Is everybody okay with that? And then keep going. Um, by the way, can I actually, we've, we've already found C1, haven't we? Mm -hmm. So can I go ahead and put 
times 13 halves here? Yeah, save me some work later. And we've already, have we found, we found the, yeah, the other guy. So let's do the first derivative there. Keep, so let's keep going. So the derivative of negative 3 halves cosine of 4t. How did you know that oh. c1 corresponds with the negative 3 halves? C1 does not correspond to me. Well, you put like C1 minus 3 halves. Like, how oh, do you know oh, 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 those oh. Two numbers? Go back to here. My whole answer is this plus this. That's the yeah. whole answer. So that. if I replace T with 0, I'm going to have a C1 times 1. Oh, okay. 0, oh, 0, okay. negative 3 halves times 1. Okay. Yeah. So yeah remember, you're, you, we were finding X of 0. So in a moment, we're going to find DX DT at... Zero. So I have to first find dx dt. So what's the second line going to be? Uh, six, six sine four t. Sine of four t. It's too far away. And then what's the next one going to be? Uh, eight. Cosine. Plus or minus? Plus. Plus eight. eight cosine four t. Cosine of four t. Beautiful. So now dx dt evaluated at t equals zero, or you could say x prime of zero. That's probably easier. Same thing. All right. So what do we get? That's a zero. That's going to be negative 13 plus C2. That's a 0 plus 8. Now, everybody see where I'm getting those from. And what must that equal? I believe it's Do we have it up there somewhere? What was? Negative 50. It's negative 50? I don't know. Oh, there we go. There we go. Right here. It's right here. OK, do I have it in here somewhere? Yes, I do. All right. Is that what that says? Yeah. Yes. Do I have the same numbers? We moved two. everything to the other side. And so we got negative 45. Is that yeah. what we got here? Yeah. yeah. And this whole thing equals 50. Yeah. Well, something doesn't feel right. Negative. Oh, negative 50. Negative. Oh, negative. There we go. And that's negative 5. When we add it, we get C2 is negative 45. Yeah. And that's, that's correct? Why didn't you <laughs> multiply through by 2? Is it because it's C1 was 13 over 2? Did I multiply through by 2? When you went from here x prime of t, because it's <coughs> negative 2, C1, e. Well, because we have to take the derivative of this. Uh, okay. The chain rule factor was negative 2, right? Okay. Yeah, that, don't forget, we, that was a derivative that wasn't the original function. So now, our final answer is we have a 13 halves here. We have a minus 45 there, minus 3 halves cosine plus 2 sine. Everybody cool with that? Would you like to see what it looks like? Mm -hmm. This is the funnest part. Mm -hmm. Give me one sec here. Today in my Calc 2 class, we use Wolfram to do, we were doing series and I introduced alternating series. And I did the first 100 terms of the harmonic, and the first 1,000, and the first million, and the first million, it was still like 18. But I said, you notice every time I changed the upper limit, we were still changing in the digits category. Then I did 1 over n squared. And we got a number, and then what we noticed was the changes only occurred further and further out in the decimals. And by the time we got to a million, you know, the decimals were changing, like, you know, the 20th decimal place. So that's the difference between a convergent and a divergent series is in a divergent series, the changes will always happen up front. The, the first numbers are constantly changing. But in a convergent ones, the changes occur later and later and later. So then I did the alternating harmonic. I did the first hundred, the first thousand, the first million, and they're like, oh my god, the numbers are not changing. In fact, they look like 0.69 something, and then I showed them, it's, I just told them, I'll show them in a couple weeks, natural log of two. And then I did the same thing with one over n squared, and they see it was 1.64, and it didn't change, and they showed them it's, it's actually pi squared over 6. It's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. But the point was, I could do this instantaneously using Wolfram. I did a series where I added a million terms. Back in the day, there was a time when every single student in the calculus class had a graphing calculator. I'm talking in the 90s. Everybody had a graphing calculator. So I'd start a class and go, well, you add up the first thousand, you add up the first million, maybe you add up the first billion, and just wave, wave at me when you get a number. And during the course, you know, by the end of the course, you might have a number because it took your calculator that long. But then we could see these results. Can you imagine taking two hours to get the result? We were getting it in literally two seconds. 
just I love this kind of stuff. It's oh, it's so cool. All right, so we want to graph this, and I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it as y equals because Desmos it's x and y. It's it's just easier. Okay, and help me. Out. Our first number was thirteen. Thirteen. Thirteen half. Oh, is it 13 halves? Oh, yeah, sorry. Okay, then let me do, I'll do 6.5. It'll be easier on this. And then the second number was? Uh, was it 45. minus 45? Yes. And it was, I'm going to use X. And then it minus was minus 1.5 for cosine 4X. And then plus 2 sine. Okay, help me out. Make sure. Does that look right? I'm changing. I'm yeah. changing it to x and y just to make it easier on this. Do you notice something? I'm, I, as I'm staggering back, That's what not, isn't it doing? Yeah. Why? Because we have a, a no. pressing. Because I got a motor on it. Yeah. You like that? I put yeah. a motor on it. Clearly. <laughs> So what is it doing? It's it's staying literally. Are those exactly the same height forever and ever? No. No, but they're asymptotic to something that is. So in a very short period of time, you don't see that. Now I put a motor on it. What happens to all motors at some point? All motors at some point do what? Come on. They die. And then what happens? You fly away. It's uh, it's over, man. Right, when it goes straight to zero? Right. It didn't even right. cross it. Right. Well, actually, it probably yeah. does. It probably does. I don't know how far I'm going to have to zoom in. I think the red line right now is barely over the x-axis. Barely over. Yeah. I would have to really keep zooming. I think the red line barely over, and then it's... But for all practical if purposes. You, if you click down on the, uh, the line... What do you mean? You just like click, just and click hold, it and then hold, hold it. There you go. You can drag them on and see what the, the y value is. Oh, 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 I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Three, two, one. Hold on. <laughs> oh, there they go. Well, why is it saying zero? It's not zero. It's, yeah, it's so close, too close for it. Because it's yeah. so small for all practical purposes, it might as well yeah. be. But this is a beautiful demonstration of what we already know. Sorry, let me go back. So the damped harmonic motion is because it's not oscillating. I like to refer to this as severely damped because it came right back. Good shock absorber. That's literally the idea. Uh, and that's the example I always use when I'm explaining harmonic motion, uh, damped harmonic motion. Has anyone ever been in a car with not great shocks? <laughs> Ride with me. OK, I have an old RAV4, and nobody can fall asleep. Because you feel every bump, and you feel every bump for, for a little while. <laughs> you know, we eventually flatten out, but it's it's one of these where you got a little bit. That's not great shock absorbers, but you know it's it's got a very stiff suspension, and that's you know it's okay. I never fall asleep while I'm driving, but that's the beautiful thing is that we just did this problem without the impressed force, and it's exactly what we were expecting it to be. Isn't that cool? So anyway, that's that's the spring problem, folks. That, that was the whole point of doing the spring problem, was not because you need to know about springs. No, it gave us a vehicle to use all the stuff we've learned over the last month to solve a problem. But what did we use in here? Think about it. What did we use? Uh, the variation. Uh, no, we didn't use variation. We used, undetermined. We used method of undetermined coefficients after we used the auxiliary equation to find the roots. We had a repeated root. We dealt with that. Then we used undetermined coefficients to find the other pieces. Right? And then we solved initial conditions. We, we don't usually get to do that many things in one problem. Was any individual step hard? No. Right. Not possible. Not, not even close. Now, I'm pretty sure I did everything right. Is there a check? Yeah, go back and, and check your initial conditions. That's always the easiest check. Okay? All right, let's go ahead and stop that. Let me just press straight down on the red.